Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our guests at this moment are key players in the Take It Back movement. They will be talking about the, their party's national convention, which is built to take place on the 6th of October, and also other political issues. Joining us in the studio right now is uh, Omoyele Showere, a presidential aspirant under the platform of the African Action Congress, AAC, and Malcolm Fabi, who is the director general of the Take It Back movement. Gentlemen, welcome to the morning show. Thank you so much. Welcome to the morning show. Sure, it's good Thank to you. see you again. Thank you. And Thank uh, you good for to see uh, Malcolm Fabi, who is. Uh, who has moved from engineering to politics. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Marco, nice. let me start with you. I mean, you are running the Take It Back uh, campaign for Shure, who is your candidate. Yes. And you guys are going to your party's convention tomorrow. How That's prepared right. is, your, is your candidate, or if I like, uh, your aspirant? He is incredibly prepared. Um, I've known Shure for 30 years. We met when we were undergraduates at the University of Lagos. Um, I got into Unilag in 1990. He was already in Unilag a year before I got in. And what Nigerians are seeing today, the courageous Shore, the Shore who won't take no for an answer, the Shore who is principled, a straight arrow, somebody who knows exactly what it is that he wants out of a situation, and the Shore that is committed to Nigeria is a Shore that I saw 30 years ago when I met him. So in terms of personal preparation, he's incredibly prepared. If the question is about the platform and the vehicle that we will use for the elections, which is the Take It Back movement and the AAC, the political party, uh, what I'll tell you is that we are certainly more prepared than anybody else, and this is the reason why. I believe that for the first time in Nigeria's history, we have a movement preceding a political party. And this is why it's important. Today, everybody in the PDP is switching over to the APC, and there are people in the APC switching over to the PDP. You need to ask yourself the question, why is it possible that people can seamlessly leave one party for another party, and there would be no contradiction, at least in their perception of what's going on? I'm based in the US. If you go to the US and you say somebody is a Democrat, without even knowing that person, you can tell about 80 to 90% of what that person believes about government, the role of government in governance, and what government thinks about issues like social welfare or infrastructure. You know exactly what they believe. If somebody tells you that they are a Republican, you will know at least 80 to 90% of what they believe. In this country, what does the APC believe? What does the they PDP the broom, believe? The broom. They, they, well, so so the, 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 the point The PDP has the umbrella. The, there we go, sir. But the point is, in our view, it was extremely important that we begin with what we believe as a group and as a people. And that's why we started with the movement. The movement preceded the party. And both the movement and the party were actually founded by Shoure with the backing of a lot of us that have known him over time, either at the University of Lagos and through the students' movement, or people that have known him since 2006 but when, you when he established the, when Sahara you go to the convention, is he going to be the only candidate and he will just, his candidature will be ratified, or there are other contenders for uh, the party's flag, presidential flag? Well, right now, he is the only candidate that has completed all of the steps. It was completely thrown open. In fact, there were, throughout the process, there were a number of people who expressed an interest. But then, as you know, politically, I think you, it's one thing to express an interest. It's also another thing to look at the reality of what is on the ground. Sure, let me come to you. I mean, as you go to the party convention tomorrow, did you have to uh, buy expression of interest form and nomination form? I know if you did, how much did you pay? Uh, we, uh, we only had a nomination form that I paid for. And, uh, How much? Fifty million? Was, no, it was uh, for two million naira. It's just for property. That's still a lot. It yeah. is. Uh, it is a lot of money. And I tell you, I had to reach out to my friends who made the contributions so that I could purchase that form, because we didn't want the party not to have the capability to run its program, including the convention. These things are not particularly cheap. It would have been our. Uh, it would have been best for us not to even charge anybody anything. But this is our own contribution to make the party. The party is less than two months old. Okay. And had, we don't have godfathers. We can't access bank loans like the big politicians can do. 
So we had to reach out to ourselves, bond together, and pay that fee on my behalf, which was done last week, yes. Okay, you have said that your party, once it's set up, is going to um, be the end of the PDP and the yes. APC, correct? Yes, how, yes. How, how is that? How do you oh, well, that? don't you see APC unraveling in Lagos? You know, they're falling apart as uh, they are going down. Uh, the PDP is in such terrible sh shape now. They have become a personal liability company of one person in Port Harcourt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it can't get worse than that. And before that, they tried to even change their name because they have such a bad reputation that uh, they had to look for smaller parties to form a coalition, even though they had always claimed that they're the biggest party on, Af on the continent of Africa. How do you then start reaching out to briefcase parties to form a coalition when you claim that you are the biggest. It's just like a father reaching out to his children to form a family. Well, you say you want to take, take you, you call your movement taking back. back. Yes. yes. Yeah. What exactly are you taking back and how? Because if you look at uh, what happened in Lagos during the APC primaries, yes. some people actually emerge, I mean, uh, hid under the wings of the, uh, of the governor, Ambode. Uh, and Ambode, you know, I guess was also trying to take back democracy from the hands of those who have hijacked it. But at the end of the day, he couldn't. He ended up uh, apologizing, and it, the godfather had his way. It is the reason why ours uh, is different. That we started with the movement. Ambody is a creation of the godfather in Lagos. When a godfather creates you as a godson, when he's done with you, he will bury you. That's what happened. And that's why Ambody unraveled very quickly. That's why he fell apart very quickly, because there was no ideology. Nobody knew Ambode. It's the same thing that will happen another four years or in a few months mm -hmm. when the Sangwolu guy uh, start to maintain any form of independence from the godfathers of Lagos politics. They will bury him the same way. It's the reason why we, the people of Lagos must adopt a take-it-back approach, take back their state from a godfather that is controlling, that sees it as a personal estate. You know, and if you doubt, take it back. When you see Obama in California campaigning for candidates in the U.S. saying that they want to take back their country from whomever, right. you understand that this is one idea that is not only local, but international and global in nature. So it encompasses everything we've lost, everything we think we're losing, and how to re retrieve that and start to rebuild our lives. And Lagos is a big example of where you should even apply that particular slogan. Uh, uh, take it back. Lagos needs to quickly take back the states, and we will take back the rest of Nigeria, including Lagos. Well, the last time you were here, yes. you know, I was trying to suggest that it looks like you are the only person in the AAC. Yes. So it's good to see uh, Dr. Yeah. Malcolm Fabi and to see that you are having uh, this convention tomorrow. Yeah. But are you going to uh, also have primaries at other levels? Do you have candidates who want to be governor, who want to go to uh, the legislative houses, both at the state and the federal level, do you have such aspirants who will also be part of the process? Tomorrow? The answer is yes. Okay. So one of the things we realize very quickly is that Nigeria's problem is not just a problem of leadership at the top, the presidency, but that every institution of governance, whether you're talking about the Senate, whether you're talking about the House of Reps, or whether you're talking about the state executives, the governors, and the state houses of assembly, and the local governments, at the chairperson level and the councillor level. Our fundamental view was this, that if we could birth a movement, create a party, have a candidate that is a person of integrity and can win the presidency, and will win the presidency, then we would be remiss not to ensure, if it, when he wins the presidency, he will win states. Whatever state he wins, then it means anybody on the platform of our party who was a gubernatorial candidate in that state would have a fighting chance of winning. It would mean that in all the senatorial districts that he would carry, that anybody on the platform of our party would be somebody who would have had the opportunity to actually win there. It's not just about winning. What we're trying to do is to ensure that at every single level of governance in the country, that we find people that are capable, people that have integrity, and completely ensure that we're not only taking back the presidency, that we're taking Nigeria back, we're, we're, we're grabbing Nigeria back from those that have held it captive at every single level of governance. So the answer to your question, sir, is this. We have already, as of today, held congresses in 30 states. These are the 30 states where we had candidates that overlap. So, you know, obviously the role of the state congresses is to ensure that you have primaries that can determine that if there are 
two people going for a senatorial position in, in one senatorial district. You can have a way of resolve, resolving that. We have held congresses in 30 states as of today. All the remaining, the convention is going to be holding tomorrow. We have over 200 candidates for positions from gubernatorial offices across several states to senatorial, to House of Reps, to state houses of assembly. In fact, in December, Take It Back movement has 40 candidates that we're going to be running in Ondo State. Ondo is going to have its local government elections this year. So our view is that it's from the top to the bottom. We're not running a one-man party. We're running a party that is intending to contend for the soul and the heart of Nigeria in 2019. Well, for our own education, I mean, Shore earlier on said he paid two million naira. That's right. I mean, that must be uh, one of the most affordable, I think, uh, if you look at what is paid in other political parties, yes, right? So if the uh, presidential aspirant pays two million to take a nomination form, how much have, have you others? asked the others to pay? I'll be very happy to tell you this, yes. sir. So let us start with who is not paid. Who's in our party, paying? who is not paid? Okay. Every handicapped person, every teacher, every person in the medical profession, every retired officer that has served in the security services of this country, every person on, at, that is 25 and below that wants to run on our platform is not paid. Any woman running on the platform of our platform is paying 25% of what everybody else pays because we believe there's a significant gender gap in the country. Okay. Now to who is paying? The presidency is 25 million, they are 2 million naira. Yeah. The gubernatorial aspirants are paying 750,000. The senatorial aspirants are paying 500,000. The House of Reps members are paying 250. And then those going for uh, state houses of assembly are paying about 100. And then the local government uh, chairpersons are 50,000. And the councillors are paying 20,000. That's, they, they are the cheapest rates that you will find anywhere. And it's intentional because if a presidential ticket is 25 million or 50 million now. There's absolutely no way that anybody is going to pay for that without having to go to somebody else and asking that person to loan you the money. There and then you already have a godfather. So that's where we, we set those rates to be affordable. And as I indicated earlier, sir, we also very clearly have spelled out that the lack of funds should not stop people who have ability from being able to run for office. Well, Shibure, I come back to you. Yes. The last time you were here, I mean, uh, we talked about a lot of things. But after the program, uh, during some of your campaigns, you ran into some controversies. Yes. Uh, about you saying you will legalize marijuana <laughs> and, uh, you know, you will, you will encourage Nigerians to take marijuana. And that Igbo is, uh, as you called it, is something that is produced in, in the fertile grounds of, uh, is it a kitty state or no state? So how has marijuana become such a big campaign issue? No, no, I, let me correct it. I didn't say I would legalize marijuana, but I know that some kind of legal framework has to exist to do what I'm planning to do, which is export of marijuana uh, to the international market. It's a billion dollar industry. In fact, it's going to reach $65 billion uh, in the next year or so. And just as I was saying that here, Ghana was also saying that it will be exporting uh, 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 marijuana, cannabis as they call it. South Africa legalized it through their high court. Coca-Cola is going to be infusing marijuana into their drinks. What I'm saying is that if you are clairvoyant enough, you can get in the game before they claim that our own marijuana cannabis here is illegal or unhealthy. It's going to be somehow the oil of the future because the world is taking ahead of the rest of us. The medicinal value of marijuana alone, if you do the study, Google will help you. We show to you that there's a lot of cures, including using it to cure seizures. Uh, you use it to cure parts of cancer. They use them in making clothes. The hemp plant itself is the strongest, better than cotton. In fact, in the US, the reason why marijuana was initially attacked was because the people who were growing cotton didn't want marijuana, I mean, hemp to contest with their product. You know, but you live in a country where there's legalization of cigarette that kills people, and you are complaining about marijuana, which you can grow naturally, has natural values. In fact, it's known to have better uses than cigarette, I mean, than any other thing, including alcohol. Every night in this country, when you go to a nightclub on a Friday, on Saturday, you take back huge amount of dollars to France, 
you know, to, the, to Europe and America from drinking champagne. But you've got a product, you've got a plant in your country that grows very well. You know, we're saying use your science so that you can get into the game and get into the future. As of yesterday, Canada has legalized people carrying marijuana in local flights because they realize the value. In Amsterdam, you can buy marijuana to smoke in a coffee shop. They call them coffee shop. It's a huge industry out there. If I'm in Nigeria and we can get a kitty state, a do state, a non do state of Bessel, where it is best grown, to be making $4 billion a year, I would prefer that than going to the Federal Executive Council every month to be begging for you know, handouts from oil, uh, oil sales. So it's important to get it. This is a clairvoyance. This is seen into the future. And you can imagine that as soon as we made that pronouncement here, the rest of the world seems that they were listening to me in the studio with you, that, I mean, where I said it. And everybody is just talking about how marijuana can become, that has become a product. It's already a product. It's, we can't have, it's become, the day that Coca-Cola said they were going to infuse marijuana into their drinks, the stock rose sharply. It's already been marketed in stock markets around the world. There are marijuana cannabis shares already that people are investing in, people can see into the future. But unfortunately here, you know, our leaders are so backward, we are not thinking along the rest of the world. That's why our infrastructure is broken. That's why the country is broken, because we have analog thinkers ruling a digital society. Well, my concern when I read the story yes. is that, I mean, in a multi-religious country like this, mm -hmm. where religion, you know, uh, religious sentiments are very strong. Mm -hmm. and there were people commenting that, ah, uh, uh, Shore wants to introduce uh, Igbo to the government. No, let let me explain something Why to you. Why doesn't he talk about cassava, talk about grains, no, no, or talk yes. about agriculture? As a matter of fact, I made that comment at a health seminar, you know, when they were talking about traditional medicine. They say, when you want to talk about traditional medicine, think about what is most valuable traditionally that you have. In the first place, if you want to buy a boat today in this studio, somebody will bring it to you. You can order it. In fact, they sell paraphernalia of no, making marijuana. Secret smoking is not allowed. No, I'm just saying that <laughs> you studio. can get it. You can get it even from the NDLA. Don't waste your time. But if you go to shop right today, you want to buy the paraphernalia for make for smoking marijuana. Yeah. They will sell it to you. Okay, so, so your intention is not to legalize marijuana. No, I mean, that, look, the marijuana is available in Nigeria already. We're wasting our time discussing whether to legalize it or not. Even the pastors and uh, the imams we are talking about, they smoke it. They they take. Marijuana. We know that. You know a Pro certain Nigerian pastor who takes a oh marijuana. Oh my goodness. <laughs> don't, let us, don't let us get started when it comes to that. Fela can answer that question <laughs> for you. But everybody knows that people have their secret habits. They get high on all kinds of things. They drink alcohol. They smoke cigarettes. We know all these things. But that's not the issue. I'm talking about the economic value of that plant in 21st century global world that you can market this thing. And if you don't get in the game too early, Americans will pretend their own weed, and they will ask you or force you to be importing into, into your country to kill glaucoma, to kill cancer, to kill seizures, you know, epilepsy, and all those things that you just need to do research in the last two weeks. The discussion about marijuana has ballooned to the point that it's almost the trending topic for about two weeks when Coca-Cola got in the game. Yeah, when, you know, when you I, go to the convention tomorrow, yes. what are you likely to be saying to the party delegates and through that convention to Nigerians? Well, you should ask us what the party delegates are going to be saying to Nigeria, because it's a convention in which a lot of convergence of opinion, persons, and ideas are coming to uh, crystallize. So I'm not in a hurry to say what everybody knows what I've been saying, and we're going to say more tomorrow. But you get to know, just like you find out about Malcolm, one of the most brilliant persons produced out of the University of Lagos, know, yeah. sitting first next class, to a first class first student class who went from University of Lagos to Cambridge without doing a master's degree. These are the kind of people that we have behind the movement. Now we have a lot of them, both within and outside of Nigeria. But what we decided when we started is not to let them be disturbed because they are doing the brain work, uh, they are the brain, uh, brain trust of the, of, of the movement and eventually the party. So when you see Malcolm, you can imagine how many other, before Malcolm to jump behind an idea like this, that tells you that you know, the other big parties of gerontocrats and morontocrats are in trouble. Okay, so you have 10 executives right, right now, correct? No, we, and, we have more than 10. We have executives as we have Congre party mm -hmm. states that have already completed their state congresses. Right. You know, we have a national convention tomorrow. 
-hmm. Even already, we have program officers are over 40. We have 120 one, yeah, uh, national officers. officers. Right. All of them are fully committed to doing this, and they are legitimate in their own right. And tomorrow, there will be ratification of some of those positions, there will be new elections into mm -hmm. positions that are open. Or some so that you have, you have some new pos you're, you still have positions that are open, right? Like like the treasurer it's a, it's and the a financial. It's a very dynamic process. Right. You know, positions will be open even after we're done tomorrow. Positions will yeah. continue to evolve. Well, Malcolm, after the convention tomorrow, yes, I mean we know already that he's going to emerge as the uh, presidential candidate. We don't know that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you are so far the only candidate. You are the only aspirant. You said so earlier. Yeah. You know so. What are we likely to see after the uh, convention as we go towards the uh, election from the party? Okay. So what you've seen so far from the movement and the party is a disruption of the political process. I think it was in March that we came out openly, that Shore came out openly and said he was running. And it was also coinciding with that time that we set up both the movement and then eventually um, the process of starting to birth a party. Now, in the process of birthing the party, there were also a number of things that we did. We, the first thing we wanted to do was to obviously engage and see whether there were other parties out there that we could potentially work together with. But what you've seen so far is a disruption of the process. This is the first time in Nigeria's political history, we believe, that town hall sessions have become the currency for engaging with the Nigerian people. So one of the things we did, both with Showare as well as with other members of our party that are running for different offices, is that the mode of campaigning has been changed. It's not now no longer just about rallies, where there's no exchange of ideas. I can't exchange ideas with anybody at a rally. I can wave brooms and I can swing umbrellas, but I cannot ask somebody what their plans and programs are. So one of the things we've done so far We've had over 100 events, town halls, practically every single state in Nigeria has been touched by Shore and others within the party, where we've gone out to engage with Nigerians and share ideas with them. Not only has the campaigning happened in Nigeria, it's also been happening in diaspora. Why? Because we have 20 million Nigerians in diaspora. Yeah, but they, they are not voting. They're not voting, but here's the interesting things, and I, I, I will very easily and I will share with you some of our strategies. We have 20 million Nigerians in diaspora. The diasporan community contributes on an annual basis about $33 billion to the Nigerian economy. That is the size of the Nigerian budget. There are, where two or three diasporans are gathered, the one topic that brings everybody together is the question of how to move Nigeria forward. Nobody is outside this country because they love to be outside this country. The people that are outside this country are outside this country because of the frustrations that they have about the Nigerian system. And here's the strategy that are diaspora. This is why they're important. This is why Shore spends time engaging with them. At least every Nigerian has five people, family members, friends, that they can engage with. Okay. Five people that they can talk to. Five people that they can encourage to take their PVCs and do something positive with it. So our diaspora strategy, so we locally, our strategy is direct engagement. You're going to see more of that after the convention. We're going to keep pounding the streets. We're going to keep doing town halls. We're going to keep doing grassroots mobilization events. And then our friends, colleagues, brothers, and sisters in diaspora, we will engage them to begin to engage with the people that they have. They may not have a single PVC, but guess what? They have family friends. They have brothers. They have sisters. They have people that they help that they're going to pick up the phone and engage with. Well, That's sure. how we intend yeah, to sure. use it. Let me ask you, what's your view on diaspora voting, oh, which yeah. a lot of Nigerians have been I, proposing? I, I, yes. I think it's the fact that that has not been resolved now is so unjust and unfair to our, our brothers and sisters in diaspora. Considering how much they love this country, considering how much they invest in the country, or they have vested interests in their country, because as Malcolm rightly mentioned, people who have left this country years ago after five years, you want to come back home. You know, a lot of people have nostalgia. They want to return back to the country. And it's one of the priorities we'll have when we win next year is to make sure that we endorse and sanctify the right of people in diaspora to vote. But beyond that, we also have a policy to allow people who have, you know, uh, historical connections with Nigeria to return to Nigeria visa-free so that they can bring their investment back. And we're talking about African-Americans, Brazilians, who find out through DNA technology 
that 51% of their body or their makeup is, is Nigerian to be able to come back to this country visa-free. We are not saying that you not get some processing fee upon arrival, but you must be able to return here and invest here. Because Nigeria, as you know, we had, through Badagri alone, they exported over, I mean, over 43 million people were sent into slavery over 400 years. Mm -hmm. And these people are also issued to come back home. Right. But you see, we, we conduct elections in Nigeria. Yeah. Those elections are rigged, figures are inflated, uh, if you now add the uh, diaspora voting to it, I mean, won't we have a situation whereby all kinds of figures, inflated figures, will come from all over the world? Uh, More so as many Nigerians abroad are not even registered with the embassy. No, no. How do you intend to resolve no, that's, that? That's, that's not true. The, in fact, the reason why they don't like diaspora voting is because first, they can't bribe people in diaspora with rice and pieces of Ankara. And secondly, they could give them something else. No, they haven't been able to do that. I've been in the diaspora for 19 years. I've been in the U.S. for 19 years. They have never succeeded, you know, bribing people in that part of the world because you can reason a lot of them are doing so well. They don't need anything from you. They just want a country that works for them. Secondly, is that technology will help. Even if you look at generally how they conduct elections, is they've moved away from the crude and barbaric way of just manipulating figures to now waiting and hanging around polling booths and polling units to bribe people, what they call see and buy. That too shows you that technology is pushing them you know, over the cliff. And it's a matter of time. And diaspora has been able to contribute successfully to promoting transparency in this country. We discussed this last time I was here about how, you know, we made your life miserable when you were the minister, I mean, the, the special advisor to the president. It was a diaspora project. To oh, you guys had a project to <laughs> deal <laughs> with me? <laughs> no, no. I mean, the, 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 the media, the new media at that point, you okay. know, that you talked about was something that we dreamt about in diaspora to disrupt the, the you know, the, the media space yeah. and the political yeah, space. space in the country. And it helped a lot. You and I worked together before. You know, most people don't know this. Before you went and worked with Jonathan, we worked together on Yara Dua, mm -hmm. changing ideas. Is it dead? Is it alive? Because you needed to be writing articles and, you know, your columns to update Nigerians about this. We always bounce ideas uh, off, uh, off of each other. So this kind of collaboration between the diaspora and people at home would be the ultimate uh, winner for the Nigerian people because People have skill sets out there. You know, there are nuclear scientists, Nigerians great, out there, great, doctors great. who are, you know, who are taking babies out of their wombs and replacing them. You have entrepreneurs who are managing the UK airport, who is a Nigerian. Right. And then you have an airport in Lagos and Abuja that don't have functioning toilets. It's a disgraceful thing. And these are things that we can quickly resolve when we bring a major of people in the diaspora with people at home who are very, very eager to see this country work. But what, what kind of feedback have you been getting across the demographics to your uh, plan to be president of Nigeria? I'll tell you, it's been great. You know, it's, for example, I didn't know that we'll get the kind of reception we got in places like Zamfara, in Kebbi State, in Shokoto, where in one night after we arrived to sleep, we had two sets of young people come to us and said, come have a rally because we are tired of this system. In fact, we feel that the people in the northern part of the country who are, who are, the, worst, who are the worst treated people in terms of the poverty indexes in those places are, in fact, more desirous to climb out of poverty because to them, poverty is real. It's confronting them, it's existential for them than some of us in the south who are, you know, fairly doing okay. So when we went to those places, we were surprised that people met us at city gates. Mm -hmm. They attended our town hall meetings and mass. And these town hall meetings are not manipulated. They are live streamed, you know, to everybody to see through our Facebook Live, YouTube. You can access them today in these 29 states. Mm -hmm. And we are not confronted with the issue of which religion, you know, who do you worship? I mean, and which ethnicity are you? Nobody's asking us about zoning because zoning is lazy man approach to okay. politicking, of course, in Nigeria. They know that. So Nigerians are way ahead of these people. They are embracing us. They want us to come more. Of course, we have challenges. We don't have godfathers. You know, we don't have the huge budgets that they use and washers they use in buying votes and confusing people or renting crowd. But we are engaging with Nigerians organically, and we can tell you that the feedback has been great. 
and we will go back and ensure that we keep doing what we do, do better at it until we take this country back from these gerontocrats who have destroyed the country and the morons who are running our democracy. Okay, Talking so about FIBA, you, you, you drew my attention to something you said happened somewhere. Oh, and yes. I think that you uh, had an issue at the Oni's um, Palace and uh, you were tear gassed with a bunch of your oh, group yes. of people. Uh, <laughs> Share with us that experience. No, it's, uh, that, you know, then? it's something we've put behind us, uh, yeah. but it was something that was about going to the Oni's Palace. He invited us uh, to meet with him at 12 noon. We got there and there was no, nobody attended to us for three hours. Mm -hmm. And when eventually he shows up, uh, I was asked to greet him. I greeted him the Sorry, way. what were you guys doing there? What, what it was, we, 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 to we, pay, we, know, we go around campaigning okay. and we go campaigning. to traditional palaces because they are part of the people that we need to uh, mobilize as well. And we believe that they are part of society. Culture is important to us. So by the time we got there uh, and paid him homage, the same way we did in Kano, the same way we did to the Alafian of, uh, of uh, Oyo, who is also a first class traditional. Uh, ruler in Yoruba land. They weren't happy that I did not prostrate, you know. And uh, my position was that you don't have to force anybody to prostrate for another person. No, but the, this is tradition. This it's, is culture. Yeah, it's also, it was also I mean, tradition. You want to take us back to Kungi's harvest? No, no, no. We, no, no. There, there was also People tradition. Don't respect traditional it, no, no. It was also tradition to kill twins before in this country. It was tradition to bury people under the Oba when they die. That's Who does point. that anymore? You know, if the king is driving Rolls Royce, right? It's not our culture to drive Rolls Royce. We used to walk around and climb kete kete, that is donkeys. Why don't we stay there? So the world has moved beyond a lot of this tradition. So force another man to prostrate to you simply because you are occupying no, a throne. You are near Fife. Yes. You are near Risha. Yes. You know, it's a spiritual being. Yes. It's next only to all, the Orishas. All of us, you all, know of, that. all of us are spiritual it, beings. It's not him as an individual yes. that we are prostrating to, but what he represents, that's true. No, I, I understand that we eventually did, but the... You we eventually the, prostrated. No, no, we, 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 we did the traditional cultural thing that we know how to do, but they weren't satisfied oh, with that. But your chest was not on the floor. Because right? they did, but the truth is this. You didn't the want your shirt to get <laughs> No, no, it's not that. The truth is this. The Ife, the Yorubas have a saying, that Omodegmo, Agbagmo, Lafidai, Leife. That was the evolution of Ife itself as a traditional base of the Yoruba culture of the gods it was as a result of the wisdom of both the young and the old. So Ife must keep evolving. But that's not the issue. The issue was that we were treated with this, you know, I mean, we were mistreated by being tear gassed. There was no reason why anybody would be tear gassed in the palace of a traditional rule. I've never heard that before. I didn't even know that they keep oh, tear gas. You call the police to come and We don't know gas. where the tear gas came from, but we we're all tear gas and we're out of breath. People ran out of breath. Some, some people were hospitalized, including the student who had followed us to the place. But we had resolved that, you know, I, uh, and uh, we put that behind us. But I'm just explaining that to you. you were Mark, nice. were you there? I, I wasn't. Uh, but, did but, but, you, you, too, you did not prostrate? No, I wasn't, I wasn't there. there. I wasn't there. Okay. But here's what I would say. Um, I think whether it's the issue of marijuana that we brought up before, yeah. or whether it is this question of, is it appropriate for somebody to speak truth to power? I think what we believe, and what Shore demonstrates, is that it is okay to think outside of the box that it is appropriate for you to look at your surroundings and your environment and to fundamentally ask yourself the question, are there ways that we can move things forward? So it may seem, um, as I say, I've known Shawere for 30 years. Mm -hmm. We have not always agreed on everything for the 30 years, but I'll tell you this, that there is incredible consistency in what he does, that it is that consistency that made him fight for good luck, Jonathan and fight for, and then do things that made it seem like he was supporting Buhari in 2015. Because you would ask yourself the question, no, it why? It didn't seem like he was supporting okay, you know, so, so, Buhari. So, but, but, but here's the reality. But here's the reality. You weren't, you were no, not. Yes. We can't find any evidence okay. of me supporting No, but Buhari. here's the thing, though. You know, here's the thing. I think fundamentally, it is that same thing. So the first time I saw this was in, 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 in 1993. Yes when the June 12 elections were not, he was president of the University of Lagos Students' Union. I was one of the people in the Students' Union Parliament. I was, I was chairman of a hall, and therefore part of the student cabinet at the time. 
Students did not support Abiola. In fact, Abiola was one of the people that Fela used to call the members of the international tif tif. Right, yeah. But guess what? When those elections were annulled, I remember sitting in parliament watching Shoure make the case for why we as students of the University of Lagos and why Nigerian students as a whole, even though we did not support the political process, were duty bound to fight against the annulment of June 12. It didn't make any sense. There were many people, I remember during that, that conversation, that were opposed to what he was saying. But it's the fundamentals, it's the principle. So it's that principle that made him lead a fight against uh, the annulment of June 12, even though the person that we were fighting for was not exactly our first choice. Mm -hmm. It is that same principle that actually made him fight against Obasanjo trying to stay on for a third term. It is that same principle that made him one of the first people to begin to expose the fact that a Yeradua Kabal was trying to prevent Good, good Luck Jonathan mm -hmm. from stepping into his constitutionally assured role as the person who should be the next president of the country. And those were the same things as well that enabled him to utilize his platform to ensure that the 2015 elections were free and fair and therefore led to the emergence of a Buhari as president. You would look at all those things and you would wonder, supported, you know, seem to support Jonathan, seem to support Abiola, but there's a consistency through it all. That consistency, whether it's a marijuana issue or whether it's the question of, yes, we respect culture, we respect tradition, we are a people of tradition. That's who we are, we're Africans. But we must also continue to evolve. One of the most traditional societies on earth is Japan. But guess what? Japan is also one of the most technologically advanced countries on earth. Good. Both sure, can go let together. Let me ask you a question yes. about what you've been doing with Sahara reporters, yes. fighting corruption. Yes. Now, I mean, this administration says he's been fighting corruption. But when you go, get to office, let's hope you emerge as a... It's not hope. I'm going to emerge as president. <laughs> <laughs> I like okay. that. <laughs> now, under, uh, you know, under the circumstances in which we have found ourselves, how will you wage the war against corruption? And what will you do with persons who have been identified as corrupt? Are you going to give them the rolling treatment? And also, within that uh, context, what are you going to do about illicit financial flows, yes. uh, which uh, the African Union has been talking about, particularly uh, uh, President Thabo Mbeki, yes. who is the chair of the AU Committee on Illicit Financial Flows and what it does to African economies? I, I think the first thing to say is that uh, I don't believe in death penalty, so I'm not going to give anybody a Rawlings treatment. I even met Rawlings recently and had a conversation about what he did. And uh, it's a conversation for another day. But here is what we must do, is to follow the money. You see, it has become very easy to follow money as they move around these days. And the reason why it's easy to steal from Nigeria is because even when we follow money to the point of exit, instead of closing the gates, you know, we let the money fly out. So our institutions are not working. We must make them work. And we must deploy technology in making them work. It's so easy these days to you know, even track a transaction of 10,000 Naira. Because almost everybody is carrying a card around. You spend it uh, somewhere with your debit card. You can track it there. You can track a Nigerian official who is stolen 300,000 Naira, if you really are serious with technology. You can track a lot of things. You can prevent a lot of things from happening, but we don't have the will. We don't have people who are capable of doing this. We don't have people who are capable of thinking outside of the box. Uh, uh, Doc, I remember when we started Sahara Reporters, you know, people didn't believe it would work because they didn't think, it, you know, uh, internet would have the kind of uh, uh, the penetration in Nigeria that would make it possible for people to be reading Sahara Reporters. I remember people mocking me and saying, you're not a journalist. How can you make this thing work? You know, and what I told them is, also is that newspapers are going to the museum, so you better embrace the new technology that is coming because if you are an editor, you are not waiting for news to break the next day to read it. Why would you rely on a newspaper? Anyway, coming back to what you're saying, is that there's a lot we can combat with where the world is today. If you want to walk into this studio today, maybe by next week, you likely need your fingerprint to enter into the studio. It's already available, cheap. Mm -hmm. You can use your retina to enter the place. Why are we not deploying that in the civil service? So that the 25% of the ghost workers that we've been hunting for all these years, we can just get rid of them at once with the use of technology. The same thing you do with tracking money. There's an NFIU in the system that is now independent Financial of intelligence, intelligence unit that's independent of the EFCC. They can track money because 
the banks in this country are under obligation to provide suspicious transaction reports to the NFIU. And what are suspicious uh, transaction reports? Anything that is more than mostly 10 million naira. But you can even lower the bar. And when you have all this documentation, you can use them to track people before they even steal. Because sometimes even in the US, it's difficult for money that has been stolen to be recovered when you get lawyers involved, depending on how big or good the lawyer is, judges are involved, the litigation cost alone. They just make example of people. So what you do is to prevent people from still stealing. The illicit financial flows also has to do with international Western banks aiding corruption on the continent of Africa. I say it everywhere that I'm a post-corruption and I suppose corruption, but I know for sure that the most corrupt street in the world is based in New York. It's called Wall Street, <laughs> right? So, and they never, you know, it's, it's the truth, but that is not to say that we must steal the little we have here. So we have a duty to also call those banks to order, punish them where necessary. When Halliburton gave $180 million bribe through Nigerian officials, mm -hmm. the US government made over $6 billion from fines, that were imposed on the companies, individuals that sent people to jail, so that that kind of activity or criminal intent is not repeated again in their own country. So they use that as a deterrent to stop people from stealing. But over here, how much did we get? We got $25 million. And it was because we declared Dick Cheney he almost wanted. And Halliburton quickly arranged a $25 million uh, fine to be paid to Nigeria, or compensation to be paid. How did they spend the money? He went to lawyers who used the money to set up a private airline. I reported, we reported it on Sarah Reporters. Nobody has ever countered it today. So when you have a country where there's a lot of connivance mm -hmm. between officials of government and corrupt people, and corrupt people are the ones sponsoring people to be in office, they purchase you know, political All positions right. for them. It's, you can't time. have it until you have the right guy. But you know me, Doc. If I'm president of Nigeria, corrupt guys will just be shipping out of town. OK, what program do you have in place to change the Nigerian narrative? Nigerian narrative? Yes. What, Nigerian what, what narrative will be changed by service, by running a country the way countries are run all over the world, by building infrastructure, securing the people, uh, providing electricity and power. You see, I have been in the game of this whole narrative thing. Let's change the narrative. Yeah. You cannot change the narrative of a country that is not working if you don't make the country. The moment you make the country to start working, the narrative will by itself start to change. Who is telling you the story of Rwanda? Mm -hmm. Is the airline? Is the way their streets are cleaned? You know, and I saw you wrote something about Kigali. You know, you were praising Kigali. Who told you? Did anybody pay you to write that? Now it was because of what you saw. Mm -hmm. You know, it says, so the moment Nigeria start work, who is telling the story of the new terminal in Ghana? Mm -hmm. It's Nigerians who are passing the place and yeah, uh, on Instagram and Twitter. Mm -hmm. And everybody found out that Ghana just had, there was no advertisement in Nigeria newspaper or TV that Ghana just built a new airport terminal. Let me ask you a question about education. Mm -hmm. We used to quote UNICEF say, oh, 10.5 million Nigerian uh, children of school age are out of school. Yes. Uh, now, Premium Times is a story, I think yesterday or two days ago, uh, saying that, in fact, according to a 2015 updated report, mm -hmm. that number has Gone, gone up. Yes, right. like we now have about 13.7 you know, yeah. million children yeah. out of school. Maybe yeah. in another two years, mm -hmm. maybe that number will go up again. Yes. What will you do you know, as president, if you become president, it's, to get those children into the school it's, system? It's to arrest, arrest the trend. We had a conversation yesterday, and this was over simplification of how to take you know, these kids out of, out of the streets yeah, into obviously. school. Is that we said if we spend 100,000 naira each, to train a child per year to go to primary school and eventually secondary school, it will cost Nigeria only 200 billion to take care of 10 million kids. Mm. 200, 200 billion naira is what one governor will steal easily. A minister conniving with a few people, the NMPC, they will steal that in one day. But this is what you can do to 10 million kids. And they will be going to schools where they can not only go to school and have great teachers, they'll have meals, uh, almost twice or three times a day, and they have uniform, they have sanitation, they have medical care. It's not a lot. That's the sad thing about the way they are governing this country. 200 billion naira will take 10 million kids out of the streets. And then we can make it a crime for, children, I mean, for parents to ask the kids to be hawking on the street. But you have to make that investment first. But guess what? If we don't send them to school, 
how much it will cost to put them in prison. It costs more to keep someone in prison, you know, if you don't educate them. And it's, it's, it's not to say that people who are educated can't go to prison, but we're just saying that we make the right investment. And you look at the return on investment mm -hmm. when you spend 100,000 Naira per year on a kid, some 10 years down the line. This is what you are seeing in front of you, is the investment that Awolo made on me in 1980 when I was not entitled to go to a secondary school. They brought the high school to my village. I went to the school. I went from the high school in village in my, Kribo is my village in Ondo State, Joapoy. I went all the way to an Ivy League school, competed. Malcolm came through the public school system in Nigeria. I went to Cambridge. That is what we're talking about, investment. And we are the ones now who were invested in, in 1980 and you know, be, below and beyond that time who are coming back to rescue Nigeria because Nigeria invested in us. That's the reason we are so passionate about rescuing our country. We have to make the investment in education. We have to make it for kids who want to go to primary well, school, I, for I people who go to secondary school. And the same guys. thing for university yeah. graduates, so, I mean, college students. So restructuring is, yeah. has become a buzzword yes, yes. in Nigeria. What does restructuring mean to you? It's a, I like the fact that you said it's a buzzword, <laughs> right? And it means different things to different people. Yeah. But our position is simple. There are two things. That Nigeria is due for restructuring. There's no question about that. The country that has been around for 100 years, you know, has gone through all kinds of things, war, political instability, all kinds of ethnic, religious crises needs to be restructured, you know. But the restructuring that needs to happen first has to have a generation tank to it. Mm. What is generational tank to it is that I do not subscribe to a restructuring that is going to be carried out by someone who is 80 years old on behalf of a 47-year-old guy. We are 70% of the population. I don't think that the 80-year-old people should be the ones driving the conversation about restructuring. The restructuring that Nigeria needs also needs for us to change even our fraudulent constitution that was made for us and handed over to us by the military. And we didn't sit down there, we didn't sign the document, but they say, we the people of Nigeria. And we can do that when young people who are agile, who are passionate, who have intellect and capacity take over the country. We'll restructure the country in a matter of you know, time in such a way that even things that the older generation people who are talking about boss was don't understand. Some of them don't even know how to use emails. Our restructuring well, have to have a digital know, dimension. Still a question we have for, one more for question Malcolm. For, for him. Malcolm, yes. this take it back uh, movement, yes. is it just a special purpose vehicle to get your candidate into the Asso Villa and then after that you will disband? <laughs> because I, I don't imagine that if Shoure becomes president, you still be saying you want to take it back from him. <laughs> any plan for sustaining, I like for sustaining the movement? So, so, I like that a lot. Yes. So, so the answer is that, yes, that the take it back movement will remain beyond the party. We, so this is the way we, we see it. We see the movement as the engine. The party is the vehicle itself. Mm. The engine, as long as, uh, you know, you can always have a body and a platform. Mm -hmm. But without that engine, you might have a problem. Yeah. So what we intend to do, and this is something that we always had from the beginning, is that the movement will continue beyond 2019. And if for any reason, any members of the AAC party of the Take It Back movement that have gone into governance, fail to meet the tenets that we believe in, then the, the movement is duty bound to ensure that whether it is to recall them, whether it is to campaign against them, so we're going to remain as the engine of that vehicle. We're going to keep pushing forward. Thank you very much. We're going much. to keep fighting. Thank, Thank you, Malcolm. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Shore, for Thank coming you so to the morning yes. show. Thank I you wish you good much. luck. Thank really. you. OK. Well, um, that's it from. Uh, so we're we'll take a short break now. When we come back, legal practitioner and 39-year-old presidential aspirant Eunice Atua Gide will be joining us in the studios. Stay with us. <laughs> 